Well, welcome. I want to focus a little bit on um, pivot shift injuries and menisci again. We're drilling into menisci pretty, pretty hard. And I'm starting out with, a, with an axial T2 weighted image from a, just a standard 1.5 Tesla machine using T2 fast spin echo. I'm sure many of you have already noticed that there's a pretty large fluid collection here and it's a blood fluid level. Uh, first point, meniscal tears don't give you blood fluid levels. So there has to be something else wrong, although that's not why we're showing the case. But as we scroll it, we see the reason for the blood fluid level. There's a fracture back here, which means something pretty, pretty violent happened, which leads me to the focus of this discussion, which is pivot shift injuries and meniscal pathology. I don't so much care about the ACL tear I'm going to show you or the PCL sprain that you're going to see. What I'm interested in is the menisci. But before we get to the case, I'm going to practice my drawing skills a little further. And I'm going to make you a meniscus kind of in a 3D here. I'm even going to try and make it have some depth. Yeah, so this is the, this is the height of the meniscus right here. And as we discussed before, we have an inner third, a middle third, and an outer third. Now when you have a pivot shift injury, and I, I think most of you can see me, um, what, what actually happens is the femur is going to go, the, the femur is going to go backwards and it's going to slam down on the back of the tibia. So when it does that, and, and sometimes there's a twist with it, sometimes it's just direct. And when it does that, it crunches not only the bone, because that's why we have the fracture here, but it also crunches the meniscus. So when that meniscus gets crunched, it often cracks. And that crack is usually a vertical crack in the outer third. It happens in almost every single person. Now if we look at the meniscus from the side, here's our side view, or sagittal view. This would be the back, so we'll call this posterior with a P. And this is the back where the crunching happens, right here. So we get this crunch, and then we get our crack, and that crack could be a partial crack which we do nothing about, by the way. That crack could be a crack all the way through. Pardon my lack of uh, steady hand here, or linearity. That is still, most often, not a surgical situation. What would you call that? You would call that a longitudinal vertical tear, as opposed to another kind of radial uh, alert vertical tear we're going to learn about, which is the radial vertical tear. So that longitudinal vertical tear, even though it goes top to bottom, we say it's full thickness, the first one I showed you is partial thickness, is almost never operated on. Now what do we mean by length? If that vertical tear goes from here to here, and we're able to measure it from here to there, that would be its length. Now how would we measure it? We would measure it by I'm going to have to change colors here for a moment. Let's say we have a coronal. We'd measure on the coronal from here to here because that's the part of the tear that would show up. Let's say that's two centimeters. And now the tear is going forward. See, here's the tear right here. So the next slice is going to be here. We just start adding slices. So we started out on FOSS or parallel to the tear, two centimeters. And now we add a four millimeter cut, 2.4 another four millimeter cut, 2.8, and another four millimeter cut, 3.2. So the length of this vertical tear is going to be 3.2 centimeters. Would we operate on it? Probably not. If it's not gapped, if it's in the outer third, we're still going to leave it alone, which is counter to prior teaching, where most of these very, very long vertical tears used to get sewn. Now occasionally if somebody's in there, you will see them put a stitch in it. But characteristically, this type of pivot shift tear is not surgical. Now let's take that one step further. So now that I've done my uh, very manually dexterous erasure, let's go back to our view of the meniscus from the side and our three-dimensional view. And we'll give the meniscus a little bit of depth here. I think I did a better job on this one. So sometimes 
the meniscus gets crunched. But also remember, if, and I think you can see me, the femur is going backwards, right? The tibia is going forwards like this. So there's going to be some crunching, but maybe there's a little less crunching and a little more stretching because the meniscus has to be attached to something. Remember from our, our first series, we said the meniscus was attached peripherally and at the roots, but its inner free tip, in other words, right here, is free. It's floating free. So now we are stretching. Maybe we're crunching, maybe we're not. So maybe we have the vertical tear, maybe we don't. But we're stretching. And as we stretch, 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 we get a strain or a bleed or a micro bleed. That's really common. We call that a meniscocapsular strain or a meniscocapsular hemorrhagic strain. Occasionally, if it's really violent, this will break off its attachments and it'll flip over on itself. It'll tumble. That's a true meniscocapsular separation. Those are really uncommon. In fact, they're rare. Now on the medial side, it looks a lot different than the lateral side. Because on the medial side, these attachments, which I'm going to make a little different color, they're kind of like Fats Domino, the pool player. They're kind of like short little stubby things. So you don't really see them. All you see is a bucket of blood. We'll make, we'll make that red because I'm trying to be a little clever here. So you'll see some kind of fuzzy stuff here. And if the patient's a little bit unlucky, then maybe we also happen to have a little vertical tear here as well. So you might have two things. This is an extremely common scenario. It happens in almost every pivot shift. Now sometimes what actually happens is you get this, and I'm going to make my line, if I can, through some limited manual dexterity. I'm going to make my line a little thinner, a lot thinner. And instead of having bleeding back here, instead of having a pretty good, obvious, fairly thick vertical tear over here, we have something very, very thin right next to the capsule, which a lot of times our friends misconstrue as the capsule itself, but it's not. It's in front of the capsule. And so I refer to that, it's my own terminology, I call that a sliver tear. Because it's a tiny little thin line, vertical tear, vertical longitudinal tear, right next to the capsule. And this little tear frequently coexists with that bleed. In fact, it's the majority of pivot shifts. And the minority of them, but not an insignificant minority, will have pretty, pretty thick vertical tears, but still in the outer third. All of these tears almost uniformly are non-surgical and heal because of the vascularity of the red-red zone in the outer third. Now we said earlier that this vertical longitudinal tear is one type of up and down tear. There's another kind of up and down tear that we should talk about and that is one that starts in the inner third. And instead of going up and down that that's parallel to the capsule. In other words, that's parallel to the capsule, which we'll imagine is here in red, that has some blood in it. It is perpendicular to the capsule. Kind of like the spokes on a wheel, right? The spokes on the wheel are perpendicular to the outer part of this circle. Kind of like the wheels on the bus go round and round, right? So what does that look like? Well, here's the spoke on the wheel right here. It's coming right at you. It's coming at you. Sometimes it makes a little V. That's a radial tear. And that goes into the screen. That also goes up and down. It's just in a different axis. Now we're interested in this tear because this tear can get a little bit nasty. Well, how come? Because it's in an area that doesn't heal. Remember, we have outer third, red, red zone, middle third, red, white zone, inner third, white, white zone. The white, white zone has no vascularity, doesn't heal. Okay, so we have a little tear there. When do we mess with it? When it's symptomatic. But what kind of symptoms? Pain? Maybe not. Because pain alone, maybe it breaks off, maybe it scars, maybe the pain goes away. 
But if it's pain and clicking or pain and locking or pain and progressive arthritis, then it has to be addressed. Now in the orthopedic literature, they say that if the tear has a depth of greater than six to eight millimeters, that those are more likely to become unstable, to propagate, and even to lead to consequences like fragmentation, locking, and chondromalacia. But I think we've gotten a little more liberal as time has gone on and less aggressive in trying to resect these tears because there's no sewing them. You just go in with a claw and you just claw them out of there, which is kind of ugly. So what do we mean by depth? Depth is the measurement from here, the inner edge, to the outer edge. So depth goes this way. Remember, length is completely different for the longitudinal vertical tear. For the radial vertical tear, we're more interested in this character. Now we also have gapping, you know, the side to side dimension. So the tears can get a little wide, and the more gap they are, the more troublesome they are. So depth is important, the measurement from here to here, greater than six to eight millimeters, but also the side to side dimension because gapping can lead to instability. Instability of what? Instability of the meniscus. So where might we see a problematic area of gapping? Back here near the meniscus root. Remember we have a posterior horn, posterior third, a body, middle third, an anterior horn, anterior third, to keep it simple. We also have in the deepest attachment of the meniscus, the meniscus root in the back and in the front. And although we haven't drawn them in, there are ligaments. Don't confuse the meniscus root, which is meniscus, with the meniscus root ligament. You can tear the meniscus from its root. You can tear the ligament from the bone. Now, they both have the same consequence. But what happens if you have one of these radial tears and it keeps going back, 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 to quote Chris Berman, and it keeps going back, 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 and boom, it goes to the outer surface. Now we got a problem, right? The meniscus isn't anchored to itself anymore. Doesn't matter whether the ligament's still there, this is not attached to that. And so they spread apart, and the meniscus starts to float this way, out of the edge of the femur and the tibia, and now you essentially have a meniscus that extrudes itself. So these very large radial root tears are problematic. The little ones, we leave all of those alone. We hardly ever touch the root radial tears that don't go all the way through. Even the ones that almost go all the way through, we don't touch. But the ones that clearly go all the way from the inner third to the outer third, the meniscus is starting to gap and separate, those we got to go after. So we've learned about two very important vertically oriented tears today. The one that's longitudinal and parallel to the outer portion of the meniscus, and the one that's perpendicular to the outer arc of the meniscus. The one that's parallel is less problematic because it's in the red, red zone. The one that is perpendicular is problematic. Now, if this radial tear were to arc, if it were to do something like, say, this, we would call it a flap tear. So radial tears are straighter. If it were to arc and it were to get a little bit wider and a little bit longer, now we're into a parrot beak tear, which happens to like the body horn junctions. Let's draw another meniscus for a moment, just so we can demonstrate one other thing for completeness. I realize my meniscus is a little bit thin here, but I think you can see it. Actually, I'm going to make it thicker, because I, I know I'm going to get reprimanded if I don't. Let's make a thicker meniscus. Let me erase this one, give you a little more, a little more visual stimulation here. Oh wow, that's a really thick one. Yeah, this is for all of us out there that are over age 60. So here's, our, here's a big fat meniscus. Okay, now let's make it thinner. Let's make our line thinner. 
And let's change the color. And now let's assume we have a longitudinal tear and it's in the middle third. It would be a vertical longitudinal tear in the middle third. But if that vertical longitudinal tear starts to gap and get wider and wider and wider and wider and all of a sudden this portion of the meniscus starts to go inwards, now we have ourselves a bucket handle tear. So a bucket handle tear really starts out as a vertical tear, usually in the center of the meniscus. And that will be a story for another day.